most globalization is oh tell us about it the death of globalization <laughs> yeah it's like French here yeah. the death of globalization and I want to I want to begin with a, a, this is Charles I don't know if you know Charles Tilly's work Charles uh, was at the University of Michigan and he published a book that captured my just that this is the title of the book captured my imagination big structures large processes huge comparisons and he was struck by the fact that in academia we're studying tiny well this conference DSI right well structured problems um, you know, lots of data and Tilly said what, what, what about the vast problems where measuring measurement is, is difficult and it, it occurred to me that globalization is one of these things that in a way, in a sense, it's too big. It's too big for us to understand. But we stand at a point in history. So our point of view maybe introduces biases. Maybe if we looked at today from 100 years hence, today would look different. But anyway, anyway um, here's a definition uh, I'd like to use for globalization, the process by which economic, political, cultural, social systems of nations are integrating into world systems. That world systems are planet-wide channels which transmit influence from anywhere to anywhere. And these, these, um, these world systems include uh, disease systems, uh, crime, um, culture, fashion, technology, all kinds of things. And at the extent to which the economic, political, cultural, and or social systems of nations are actually integrated in the world systems it's called the, the degree of globalization and at the degree of globalization uh, of the various economic political cultural social systems of nations varies considerably and i, I, I you, you reminded me of those articles uh alan rodman yes alan rodman's gone now yes he passed away but alan and i had a rather heated exchange yes <laughs> Yeah, in those articles. Um, in fact, uh, Mike Katabi was the, was the editor, and he invited the pieces. And I thought Alan Rubman was being quite rude to the, to the other people uh, uh, who were writing. And I, I told Mike, I, I, I want to I wanna respond to that. I, I, you know, he was just being rude. And so we wrote, we wrote uh, um, Alan's position basically was that globalization is a delusion. It doesn't exist, and um, believe it or not, I've, I've come to appreciate Alan's position somewhat. So, um, so taking the definition, think of the degree of globalization, and then these periods of time. Um, well, so, between the end of the Franco-Prussian War and the end of World War One. Or the beginning of World War One, you have to say, the degree of globalization, the degree of integration was increasing. Between the end of the Franco-Prussian War and the beginning of World War One, you could travel without a passport, you could transport currency or anything, pretty much without much paperwork. And then, of course, the end of uh, World War One and the beginning of World War Two, we saw a, a, a fragmentation of economic systems. One of the arguments that was developed in London and in Berlin on the eve of World War I is that these nations could never go to war. Why? Because they owned so much of each other. They had investments, um, billions of pounds, billions of Deutsche Marks, and it would be foolish to ruin their own economies by doing it. But of course, they went to war, and they destroyed uh, vast amounts of capital, vast amounts of infrastructure, and, and uh, re reduced uh, the world, by the way, no, World War I, World War II, these were global phenomena. War had became a, a, a global phenomenon. Um, but between the wars, we saw the rise of fascism, Nazism, uh, the Russian Revolution, and this fragmentation and, and breaking down of connectivity uh, of nations. Of course, after the end of World War II, we saw uh, globalization reasserted itself uh, with, with Bretton Woods in July 1944, where the parties tried to imagine the world after the war. Um, 
what kind of mechanisms would we need to ensure that nations never fight again? So they invented the World Bank, the IMF, uh, John Maynard Keynes referred to them as those terrible twins, because they sort of set at odds against each other. Um, the United Nations, and, and so forth. So <clears throat> up, up to about uh, 2016, um, things have been proceeding, and I think folks in business schools like us, um, from my early days, I, I just thought it would continue forever. And, you know, Kenichi Omai's uh, notion of the borderless world. Uh, however, <clears throat> currently it seems to me that, that we're, on, we're on the threshold of, of, of four possible futures, depending upon how things um, work out. Uh, the two red lines, of course, represent uh, a, a, a descent into disorder uh, in the world, <clears throat> and the two blue lines represent different levels of uh, further uh, integration of the world. <clears throat> and <clears throat> there are centripetal and centri centri centripetal and uh, centrifugal forces in the world. Um, uh, Hirschman, the great uh, uh, Princeton economist, has a lovely little book, he thought it was his best book, called The Passions and the Interests. Now, I'll talk about what he meant by that. And then Isaiah Berlin came up with this notion of the, his pendulum. And going back to Charles Tilley's notion of huge comparisons, vast processes, uh, both of these uh, gentlemen are talking about uh, huge processes afoot um, in the world. So Hirschman's passions and interests, basically, he said there are, there are two forces in humanity. One are our interests, our economic interests. Uh, and, and so all of the arguments from the world, from Adam Smith on, about specialization, international trade, and how everyone benefits uh, on, on the one hand. On the other hand, he talked about these other, these other uh, aspects of being a human being, the passions. Nationalism, um, chauvinism. Um, he says they're as prevalent among human beings as the interests are, but they battle in all of us. So the passions, he said, the ferocity, avarice, ambition, which leads all of mankind astray, these three great vices would certainly destroy man on earth. And so Hirschman's a fairly modern uh, voice. He missed the Nobel Prize, but he should have probably gotten it. And then he defines, on the other hand, the interests as being things like national defense, these organizing forces, uh, politics, the, the interests produce the strength, the wealth, the wisdom of the republics causing civil happiness to emerge. And you would think that humanity, that's all we want, would be collective happiness. And yet, um, history suggests otherwise. So this last comment from him, through intelligent laws, i.e. the interests, the rational side of being a human being, the passions, the irrational, the chauvinistic nationalism, uh, the passions of men who are entirely occupied by the pursuit of their private utility are transformed into a civil order which permits men to live in a human society. There he is paraphrasing Adam Smith's uh, invisible hand. And then uh, Isaiah Berlin talks about a similar vast process, he, he talks about, this is uh, uh, Isaiah Berlin's pendulum, where he says the cry for national independence. Where does that come from? Why, why, why do people want to be nationally independent? If it's to their economic detriment. You know, you listen, you listen to the trade economists and it just seems unthinkable that people would prefer poverty uh, and, and independence to uh, uh, rising incomes and dependence. Um, uh, 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 Gandhi one time said, um, uh, you know, who wouldn't prefer their own personal dictator to a foreign benevolent uh, ruler? It's, uh, um, anyway, so he says the cry for national independence to demand not to be interfered with or dictated to by organized buyers at times leads to the creations of larger units and to centralization. And then on the other hand, he says at other times, in the, 
in the seasons of human experience. The opposite ideal emerges, escape from huge impersonal authority in Britain right now, Brexit. It, I don't believe it can be explained in rational terms. It's a, it's a, it's a gut instinct, mm. uh, a, a, a revulsion against bureaucracy. The Brits, the Brexiters, don't care to hear the arguments for economic rationalization. It, it doesn't, it doesn't sway them uh, because they want to, they want to escape from huge impersonal authority that ignores ethnic, religious differences and a craving for natural units of human size. So Isaiah Berlin saw that across vast sweeps of history, these, these, these the big aggregations of humanity into larger and larger units, and then the disaggregation of humanity into smaller and smaller units. And here are some telltale signs that I see in the world today. First one is incompatible worldviews. We, we've assumed in the West that Adam Smith's vision of economic rationalization and all of the economic arguments since Smith, Ricardo and so forth for comparative advantage, they make perfect sense. And yet, they don't necessarily fit the worldviews of others. For some, our wealth is not uh, 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 the objective function of life. It's simply not the objective function of life. And so in the world today, we have incompatible uh, world views, ISIS, for example, mm -hmm. China, for example, um, Russia, for example, I would argue have um, uh, uh, legitimate in, in their ways, but different ways of viewing the world. Uh, so we have com competition for world uh, hegemony. Uh, it's curious to Westerners to look at Hong Kong right now. Mm -hmm. It just seems like a no-brainer, but viewed, viewed from uh, Beijing, uh, here we have an unruly force that, that may disrupt the order in a well-ordered, otherwise well-ordered society. Um, increasing tariffs since uh, Donald Trump, uh, but, but was beginning before. Trade wars, uh, the reshoring uh, phenomenon where we were bringing jobs back. Again, uh, wasn't too many years ago when offshoring was the big, big thing. Uh, growing regionalization, Brexit, just the, uh, symbolic of, of movements like it uh, everywhere. The globalization of crime, big article today on, on Mexican cartels that have operations in 20 mm. countries around the world. Uh, you know, they are hiring analytics specialists too. Mm. Um, disease, uh, our, our, our friends in the world of communicable diseases have conferences on how diseases are transmitted, and they have to have globalized models. And so there's a lot of uh, you know, efforts, for example, to isolate, the, uh, to isolate um, the, the Congo right now. And uh, you know, many nations are thinking, well, you know, uh, 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 isolation may, may be a way forward there. So back to this, pondering these, these different possible, uh, as we stand today in 2019, thinking about the future of this Trump's vision continued, and, and forget, forget the politics of the thing, just, just the effect on, on this thing called globalization. Um, Did you say the Trump's? Trump. Trump. Donald Trump. I'm, I'm not being political enough. No, 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 no. I, yeah. No, no. I, I just want to make sure I heard you right. Yeah. Um, are we heading for Kenichio Mai's one world? Is it, are things going to sort of right themselves and we're going to continue on that path? Or are we going to fall back on a world uh, of, of trade agreements or regionally divided trading blocks? If you go back and read George Orwell's 1984, uh, he imagined the world in the future divided into three huge uh, uh, and divided uh, trading blocks. Or uh, global autarky. It's happened before. Uh, not in recent history, but it, it's happened. Or time. Uh, in in uh, Germany in the um, 1300s, uh, the, the Thirty Years' War, the Hundred Years' War, where, where humanity laid waste of vast, vast tracts, destroyed capital, destroyed value, um, and so to finish up then, um, four different futures 
I don't know what the probabilities are in one world. I, these are just conjectural. Or for those scientific. They're scientific. It, it is scientific. Um, one world, I think, is looking less likely than it did 20 years ago, maybe. World trade, trade agreements. Uh, regionally divided trading blocks is beginning, to me, to look like sort of the direction uh, we're going. As China starting to try to build uh, a, a group of friendly nations. Uh, or global or talking. And then, final slide. This one. Uh, so, so if we accept these four possible futures, and then we look at, so today, how, how should corporations behave? Um, I've just put in some, some conjectural. If, if firms um, engage in offshoring, um, you know, so if we can look at that, it, it just uh, my, my best uh, thoughts about in, in those different worlds, what might be the best way to proceed into the future?